So we've talked about succession in general and primary succession in particular. Let's take a closer look at secondary succession. Secondary succession, you remember, is when there is still some soil left or some plant propagules. And it happens when a forest is cleared after things start to regrow, after slash and burn agriculture common in the tropics after fields are abandoned, after agriculture, cultivation on cleared forest land, after a fire, a flood, or a dieback of a forest from a disease, or maybe after severe pest outbreaks. And there's a beautiful series of dioramas in the Harvard, at the Harvard Forest, and I took these pictures off the internet to look at an example of old field succession. Here's what the original forest looked like, at least original to the European settlers, not terribly transformed by the Native Americans who lived lightly on the land, but around 1700. A variety of hardwoods, including beech and maple and maybe hemlock. The forest was cleared by homesteaders who tilled the soil, took the rocks from the soil, and built rock walls. The homesteaders farmed and made a living until the mid-1800s when the Industrial Revolution started and people left their farms to go to the city to find different work. So quick-growing pine trees were the first kind of forest to grow up, but this is a successional sear, transitional phase. Here we can see the hardwoods coming in, succeeding the white pines. And here's a forest of growing, aggrading hardwoods getting bigger and thicker around 80 years later. And finally, the modern forest landscape looking very much like the original, except for a particular man made feature that stands out. Maybe you can pick it out. So it was quite a transformation from early succession to the forest that looked very much like the original forest. That's what we would call the climax hardwood forest. And here's a diagram of the things that happen over time on an abandoned field. First, annuals like weeds come in, pop up. They're gradually joined by and then replaced by perennial plants and grasses, which are host to tiny sh uh, shrub seedlings that get bigger and bigger, eventually crowding them out. And then seedlings of fast-growing Conifers come in, softwood trees, which then have small seedlings, saplings of hardwood trees, which eventually shade them out and take over for the climax. So during succession, both primary and secondary, happens more quickly with secondary, biomass increases, productivity increases, and then finally decreases again in the climax. Nutrient cycles get tighter, and usually diversity of plants increases. Changes go from quick-growing plants to slower-growing species. Very few interspecies interactions early in succession, a very open habitat, and more interactions later, competition as well as plant-animal interactions. Short-lived species are replaced by longer-lived species. And Litter, litter fall, leaves falling off, branches, etc., increases with succession. So in succession, what determines which species come in and become established, and then what determines when a species leaves? Succession has some important points that you should remember. The processes we see in succession are somewhat repeatable. This suggests 
that there may be a common um, scenario, set of common mechanisms that underlie the processes we see. However, there's not much agreement on what the mechanisms are. Some models have been proposed, a model being a simplified approximation of a process, but these models provide starting points for studying natural processes that are pretty complex. One model is that of relay floristics or facilitation where one group of species come into a given area and transform the area so that it's more hospitable to the next group of species. Then there's initial floristics. This model says everything is there, at least in some form, seeds or uh, propagules, but that different species assume dominance at different times through succession. In the late 70s, Connell and Slatier said there are three basic mechanisms in succession, facilitation, tolerance, and inhibition. And the successional models could be reinterpreted as a continuum of either first facilitation, then tolerance, then inhibition, or facilitation, inhibition, and tolerance. I guess depending which species you're focusing on. So here's an example of a facilitator, the alder, which has nitrogen-fixing bacteria living in nodules on its roots, facilitates succession because it makes the soils richer for plants that will come later. So there are a number of different natural kinds of disturbance that cause succession to take place. Fire, which may happen when lightning strikes a uh, dry landscape. Flood, grazing by native herbivores or actually by human herds. And hurricanes. So certain communities that we consider climax are actually maintained by extreme environmental conditions like some of these listed above. Let's consider what happens with fire sweeping through the landscape, burning everything above ground. All competition is removed. Fuel is eliminated or reduced, and all the nutrients tied up in the plants that have just been burned up are released. In this way, the subclimax community is maintained. It also may improve the health of the environment by eliminating pathogens and enemies. And as the place regrows and resprouts, the habitat for wildlife is enhanced. And with certain plants, many pines, for example, are serotonous, the fire causes their cones to open and their seeds to be released. So fires start from lightning or maybe geothermal sources, but through history, a lot of fires have been lit by people. There are different kinds of fires, those that are slow moving and burn the soil as well as the plants, the surface fires that go over the surface quickly, like a grass fire, and more intense fires that get up into the crown of the trees and can kill them. Here's an example of such a fire, really intense, cooking probably all those plants so that they won't survive. I like this diagram of what happens in the boreal forest, the northern forest after a fire. On the left, all the standing stems look dead, but you can see things resprouting from the base and they grow up and take over the dead stems that were there before, which eventually fall, and you get again the forest that was there originally. In 1988, there were the first of the catastrophic fires in Yellowstone National Park, our oldest national park, which had been protected from fire for many, many years, 50 years or more. <laughs> 
and everything was killed. Everybody was uh, very sad. And look at this totally black landscape, little few green sprouts coming up. There are plants with small seeds, especially widespread, adapted to come up quickly after a fire, like epilobium, the fireweed. Lots of wildflowers grow quickly with the big input of nutrients into the soil, this beautiful delphinium on the right. But after a few years, the seeds that were released by the fire led to the germination and establishment of many new lodgepole pines. So it wasn't such a disaster after all. The fire is re the forest is reborn after fire, although it looks very bare for a while. And people realize now that there should be fires at more regular intervals to clear out some of the buildup of fuel so it wouldn't be so catastrophic. So three um, properties of fire in a community affect plant life and adaptations of plants. The first is how often the fires are, the frequency. Second, how intense, and this of course is related to one, more frequent fires will lead to less intense fires because not as much fuel builds up. And lastly, the season of burn, what time of year the fire happens. All too often, con fires are set by land managers at times that are the most convenient when maybe they aren't really the natural times. Here's a picture of a cone, serotonous cone of the lodgepole pine that opened after those fires in Yellowstone. Seeds of fire-adapted plants may require fire to germinate and their germination may be influenced not only by temperature, but perhaps by smoke or NO2 or perhaps charcoal compounds. And people have done experiments separating these components, treating seeds, and finding that different species depend on different cues. But the key to germination is it's best that not all of them should germinate at once to spread out the risk. Some species also need to be cracked or scarified before they can take up water to germinate. I showed wildflowers before that often grow quickly and flower profusely after a fire. Especially the first and second years after a fire for many species. The canopy is open, lots of sunlight, and lots of nutrients. This pretty blue flower is Jacamantia pentanthos from the Florida Keys. Here are some pawpaws. They don't grow here in South Florida, but a little further north. These have underground lignotubers, so all the above ground parts of the plant can be burned up, but they will resprout after fire. So there are two alternative strategies for plants in fire-prone habitats. Those that reseed grow new plants from seed, and those that resprout from underground parts that are fireproof. We find these two strategies in chaparral, sand pine scrub, very locally in South Florida in our pine rocklands, and indeed in habitats all over the world. So these two Strategies can also be put into categories of fire recruiters, those that make new individuals from seed, versus fire persisters, those where the same individuals resprout. So another kind of disturbance, kind of frequent in the Caribbean and South Florida, is that of hurricanes. Hurricanes a serious hurricane can totally destroy everything. Trees can be upturned and broken. All the leaves can be stripped off of any standing stem. In such a situation, some plants die, but many resprout. And it is a good time also for new recruitment from seed. Different habitats in the Everglades experience differential 
mortality of trees when we monitored this after Hurricane Andrew. And people studying this phenomenon around the Caribbean, some reason that maybe it's not secondary succession, but instead direct replacement, because in certain habitats, many of the plants, even those tipped over, re-sprout in place. Here's a picture of Joe standing next to the upturned bottom of a pine tree ripped up by the hurricane and flattened during during the hurricane, showing you how the roots of the plant really grew into the rock and are pretty shallow. So this pine tree will die, but this new space created where it tipped over is a place for new plants to grow. In fact, we reasoned that hurricanes increase the heterogeneity of fuel. The fallen trees provide a lot more fuel and hotter fires on the ground beneath them when they burn. And so this may affect the regeneration of plants in the understory. So we did some experiments to look at this, looking at um, recruitment of plants where natural crowns had fallen after a fire went past through. We created artificial crowns by piling pine needles and compared that with non pine crowned or non pine needle plots. And we found that some species had seedlings that were much more abundant in the higher fuel treatments, such as on the top here, the butterfly pea, Centrosema virginiana. Some had more numbers of individuals and more flowering also, like to the left, our state wildflower, Coreopsis leavenworthii. And there are some species that are present for a while, then disappear until that area is disturbed again. One such species is the tiny polygola. It's an endangered species here in South Florida. It may be that the periodic disturbance of hurricanes and fires is needed to release the dormant seeds from the seed bank.